So um, I kind of started, I'm starting off with this base template. Uh, and I'll just kind of draw, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually build the Kubernetes um, cluster networking on top of this uh, base model. Uh, so what I have here is uh, at the very top, this uh, uh, top uh, square or rectangle, this is going to be the master. Okay, and this is going to be uh, minion, uh, I'm going to call it one and minion two. Okay, and this, uh, this connectivity, this line in the middle, this just shows that they're connected to a flat layer two network. As you see, all of the IP addresses connected to the master and the minion all share the same IP space. All right, this is how um, a stupid simple connectivity can be for a Kubernetes cluster for all the pods and stuff to be able to talk to each other. Um, okay. So inside of, of each of these, now these are the actual hosts. They're also called the nodes. Uh, they're the actual hardware servers, let's say, or uh, if they're actual individual VMs, uh, they could be nodes. Um, and inside of them is a pod. Okay. Now, pods are just collections of containers. All right? They can be one container or more. Um, often pods are uh, the containers within uh, share a similar function and that's so they can be uh, uh, addressed and, and work together in tandem. So inside here, inside of a pod, I'm going to go ahead and draw a container in each one of these. Just as an example, a pod, the pods that we drew have IP space. That IP space is not the same as the uh, host IP space that, sh that connects all of the hosts. So in this case, I'm just going to kind of overlay three common IP spaces. I'm using the 10 network to connect the physical hosts. The pod space, I will use uh, 192, 168 space, okay? Um, as you deploy, in fact, if you guys go back through your lab and you look at the deployment uh, uh, files, you'll see that you actually specify a slash 26 of an address space, and that slash 26 gets deployed, uh, gets assigned to each host for the pod. Okay, so each pod gets an address from a slash 26. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and say that this is uh, 192.168.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
Um, some examples are you can achieve layer two uh, connectivity through VXLANs, right? So actually everything shares one IP space and it could just be layer two and things can be moved around. Um, Calico is actually using layer three and it's using a tunneling mechanism. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, next. So, flannel is all layer two. Flannel is using VXLAN as a layer two, right? So, um, so that changes the architecture a little bit. What you guys have been exposed to here is Calico and it's what we're running at EDCOP um, is a layer three. So in order for this container, uh, excuse me, this pod, uh, to, to be able to reach this pod, he's got to have some routes. He's got to have some way of getting there, right? And through Cube Proxy, they tell each other whose network uh, belongs or, or is sitting on which host. Um, so they're going to go ahead and share that information. And what we're going to see is um, uh, Calico uses IP and IP tunneling, right? Most people are probably familiar if, if they've dabbled at all in networking with a GRE tunnel. Um, GRE tunnel adds an additional header between the outer and inner IPv4 headers. Um, IP and IP tunneling does not have a GRE header. So it's just whatever IP address I want to tunnel out, I'm taking my original header, putting another header on the outside, and sending it along. And I'll show you um, uh, what that looks like. So I'm actually going to draw uh, a couple of tunnels here. <laughs> All right, guys, that's enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what this is actually, in this case, this is just an example of a three-node system. It has a full mesh um, IP and IP tunnels. Okay. And if we had a hundred hosts, we would have a hundred tunnel endpoints. Um, they're all sourced off of your physical host's IP address. Okay, and that address is, is, uh, is assigned, excuse me, the interface, the virtual tunnel interface is uh, named TUNL0 by default. Um, and it's going to, uh, I'll show you the routing table, and it's going to go ahead and have uh, the slash, two. so let's say I'm on minion one, and I want to get to 192.168.1.0 slash 26 network. This host is actually going to see that as going through the tunnel. Okay, so if it wants to get to this network up top here, it actually has to go through the tunnel. Okay, and I'm going to show you guys a couple of packet captures. What we've done is we went ahead and did a packet capture here, a packet capture here, and a packet capture as it arrives here to be able to show you um, what that looks like, that IP and IP um, headers. So real quick, so when you stand up um, all these various nodes, um, does the C9 handle stand up the tunnel, or do you, as the administrator, have to stand up each tunnel? No, you don't have to do any networking. Uh, Kubernetes or uh, Calico is going to do that for you. Um, it's going to do that for you. Wait a second. Where the hell am I? Uh, IP tables. Uh, well, okay, now the. So this is a. Uh, I'm going to bring up just a couple of PCAPs just to illustrate, and then we're going to build on this. Uh, this is a PCAP. Which uh, does not, I'm, and I apologize that the IP schema does not match exactly what I'm drawing here, so, so let me walk you through it. This is actually a uh, capture from the pod interface down here. Okay, and so I'm seeing any traffic that leaves and comes in. I'm seeing, I'm capturing it from right here. And the point I'm trying to illustrate here is when we take a look at that, I'm actually pinging another pod. I'm going from one pod and I'm pinging another pod that lives on another host. And as the traffic leaves, uh, egresses and ingresses that virtual interface of the pod itself, uh, we see it as just a regular IPv4 header. There's nothing unusual or special about this traffic. This is a regular echo request, echo reply. Okay? Nothing fancy about it. When we go ahead and take a look at the PCAP from the physical interface, Uh, when we take a look at the capture from the physical interface, what uh, Wireshark does for us by default, and we can actually turn this off, is Wireshark, anytime you're capturing a tunnel, 
it strips off the IP addresses of the outer header. So what we're seeing is the same peak, the same source and the same destination. I'll pull up the other for comparison. It's going from 39.9 to 110.31. And it's going from 39.9 to 110.31. Same IPs. But when you actually take a look down here, you see we have two IPv4 headers. Right? This is IP and IP encapsulation. Okay? So what this is actually doing, it's taking the IP address, the source, which is our pod that lives on one host, and our destination is the, IP, the virtual IP address of a pod that lives on another host. When that actually leaves our host and goes on the real network in between, it's actually encapsulated in another IP header. That's what IP and IP tunneling is. It's, really, it's not magic or anything. It's pretty standard. Um, yeah, yeah. So that is a, a, a faked virtual MAC address, okay? And actually, let me, let me come back to that. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, inside, and how it stands up the networking, inside of any of your containers in your lab, if you actually get into your container and you do a uh, route, enter, you're going to see that you have one default route, and that's it. A container doesn't actually have routes that goes anywhere else. It knows only about itself and a default route that points to an IP address. And that IP address, if you check the ARP table, has a MAC address of e e e e e e e e e e e for every container in the, in the, uh, in the whole cluster. And that's because containers, they only need to know how to get to their virtual interface. Right? Once it leaves their virtual interface, they're in the host. And the host in Kubernetes takes control of that packet and decides where it needs to go. So that's the only way that a container puts a packet through a virtual interface and into the host, um, it uses that uh, destination MAC address. Yeah, okay. and the source would be the pod is coming from that virtual interface. Yeah, yep, yep, exactly. Yep, that source MAC address that you see right there is actually going to be of your pod, and those should be unique. Okay. The destination is always going to be the same for traffic leaving that virtual interface, entering into your host. Actually, would that be the pod virtual interface, or would it be the physical? That's going to be the pod. Okay. Yeah, the pod's virtual interface. Right. Yep. Okay, and uh, so this is the IP and IP encapsulation. So this is actually the IP address of a physical host IP going across our switch. We got a layer two switch in between the physical hosts and arriving at the other side that has the, the other IP. That's the outer header. Okay, when this packet is received uh, by the destination host, it strips off this IP header, sees that the destination is 10.44.110.131 and delivers it to that pod. That pod, in turn, goes ahead and sends its echo reply back. It gets re-encapsulated and comes back to the uh, original request. Okay. Um, so there's a little um, IP and IP uh, tunnel overlay. Right? And that's what we kind of drew here with the tunnels. And that's full mesh. And kind of what this means is, is that these hosts don't actually have to be joined via layer two. They don't all have to be plugged in the same switch. You can actually have remote sites. Um, that would affect your bandwidth and, and your cluster performance. But it's just because it's tunneled, the actual source doesn't need to know all of the hops in between it and the destination. It always thinks it's one hop away. Right? So we could actually have multiple networks in between these hosts, uh, and it would still function the same. Okay? Um, okay, so next. Uh, inside of each of these hosts, these physical servers, uh, yeah, I'll draw it over here and over here. This is called cube proxy. Okay, uh, this master also has a cube proxy in this uh, example. Okay, cube, and this is a container. Cube's proxy job is to dynamically build IP tables for each host as uh, containers and pods are being stood up. Okay? Everyone know what IP tables are? Okay? Okay, if, if you don't, um, IP tables is the um, um, uh, uh, Linux uh, firewall, built-in firewall. It's the net filter, uh, Linux firewall, implementation of the, the net filter, Linux firewall. Um, 
net ta uh, excuse me IP tables is a very powerful tool um, I've I, I I don't have a hate relationship with it I have a very much a love re relationship with it um, I love IP tables so I don't mind it um, but anyhow uh, I'm actually going to show you guys the IP tables um, and what Cube proxy does um, and why this is important this is important because as a packet leaves the pod and enters into the host space in here it's it's going through a physical interface. And to the Linux kernel, it's actually receiving a packet. And any time um, um, uh, a Linux box, let's say a Linux kernel, is receiving a packet, it starts to ingress IP tables. Okay? And that tells you whether or not, for instance, uh, basic IP table rules, if you're running some simple web server was, and your filter table in the input chain, you want to make sure you accept port 80. Right? There's a lot of stuff living on these hosts. There's a lot of different IP addresses. There's a lot of stuff going on. So the IP table chains are long. <laughs> and, um, and, and we'll get into that. What that means is when the packet comes in here, it hits IP tables. IP tables is also the thing that does NAT on a Linux host. Okay? And that's very important for the next thing uh, that I want to talk about. <clears throat> so in here, I'm going to try and draw it. Uh, what is a different color and a different color and call these uh, service IPs. Okay. You guys have, uh, Dan has mentioned it throughout some of the previous slides. Um, you guys have seen it, some of it um, in some of the YAML files you guys have been through. Um, service IPs don't really exist. <laughs> and that means there's no device there that ever receives that has a service IP attached to it. There's nothing, there's no VM, there's no container, there's nothing that actually is attached to a service IP. Um, it's just this imaginary instantiation of an IP address. And what I mean is that actually lives in IP tables. Okay? What would you need a service IP for? You need a service IP... Um, um, for any time you want to uh, expose a pod um, um, externally, okay? Um, and I'm not going to talk ingress just yet, but anytime you want to expose a pod um, externally. And what I mean is, if you just wanted to go from this pod over here uh, to minion number two, this pod, you can do that because that traffic it knows about each other and is going to go across the full, the full mesh tunnel. Okay, <clears throat> But if something external to your cluster needs to get to your pods, how are they actually going to route to uh, this pod's interface? It's not out in the routing table in your network. right? We're not exchanging those networks out there. We can exchange the service IPs, and we can advertise those out. And this is really cool. This is where like the magic comes in. Okay. If... Uh, if over here on Minion 2, this container is a web server, okay, we want to attach a service to this. So which means this web server source IP address is actually 192.168.1.129. But we go ahead and tell the rest of the cluster that, hey, if you want to get to that web service, you're going to go to 172.16.1. Uh, 23.1 slash 32. All of, and this information gets shared between all of the hosts via this cube proxy. Cube proxy is going to go ahead and tell all of the hosts the service IPs that live on every host. Okay? <clears throat> if I'm on minion one, and for example, we have a, uh, we have a container that we deployed yesterday. Uh, it's just an experimental one called NetDiag. It allows you to, uh, it's a container that has some network diagnostics tools built into it uh, that you can run via command line so you can get things like IP address and check ARP tables and check routes and, and stuff like that inside of a container itself uh, just to be able to help get, get to know your, your underlay and your overlay. Um, so what we did was we went ahead and made the NetDiag container the client and we stood up a quick web server. Um, and what we wanted to do was, if you actually want to hit that web server, 
your packet leaves your pod source <clears throat> via 192, 168, 1, in this example, that's 65. And what do you think the destination of that web server is going to be? It's going to be the service IP. It's going to be 172.16.23.1. Here's where the magic comes in. That network is not in any of the routing tables on any of the hosts. That network is actually not routed through any of the tunnels. It's not actually routed through there. So how do we even achieve reachability to these service IPs? Um, a little bit. You're on the right track. You're, get, you're getting close. You're getting close. You're getting close. So what's going to happen is, as the packet ingresses this, this uh, minion number one, ingresses this host, IP tables is going to catch it because IP tables is receiving any packets that come into any interface, be it a virtual interface or a physical interface. It's going to receive that. And it's going to see that, hey, you're trying to get to 172.16.23.1. It's going to do a destination NAT. So what that does is the web request was leaving this guy with the source of 192.168.1.65 and its destination was going to be 172.16.23.1. When it hits this uh, uh, IP tables role, it's going to do a destination that. It's actually going to replace this with the destination pod's IP address, 192. 168.1.129. Now, when after it passes through your NAT table, it inspects the um, the Linux kernel's routing table. The Linux kernel knows how to get to this network because of QProxy. QProxy says, "Hey, you want to get to the 192.168.1.128/26 uh, network? Come through this tunnel. And it's going to go ahead and forward that traffic through the tunnel." It's going to come out. Again, it's going to hit the IP tables and say, oh, you're destined for me. I have this pod. I have this IP address. It's a virtual interface that I have. And it's going to come and send that right into the pod itself. This web server is going to process that request and send its reply traffic back out. And when it sends a reply, it's sourcing from 192.168.1.129 is its source. And its destination is going to be uh, this guy over here. And that's how the reply traffic gets back. So to go ahead and show this and illustrate this, we went ahead and did three PCAPs. We did this exact traffic, and we did three PCAPs. I did a PCAP. Let me see. I'll do a different color. We did a PCAP here. We did a PCAP when it leaves the host. And we did a PCAP when it comes back in uh, the web server pod. So it actually alters the destination? Yeah. IP? Yeah, it okay. does that. It doesn't wrap and, it, and, and that's and that's the magic. The other and that's the magic of cube proxy. It doesn't add routes like a dynamic routing yeah. protocol, like OSPF, EIGRP, or BGP. It actually says those routing protocols actually say, "Here's my network. You want to get to this network? You come to me." Instead, it just says, "Let me change this to something you already know." Gotcha. And it changes that to something you already know and actually delivers it to its real destination. Because normally wrap it, get it in the right zip code, and then unwrap it, and then put it on the local side. So let me bring up these. We got three PCAPs. I'm going to bring them all up at the same time. I showed you the three capture points. Uh, this is going to be the curl source. So again, we did a, uh, a NetDiag uh, container talking to a quick web server. Uh, let's take a look at this flow right here. Our real pod source was 10.244.39.9. And the service IP of the web server was 10.108.22.238. We're trying to hit the service IP is our destination. Okay. Now remember this, I'm going to point it out again, is coming out of this capture point right here. So as it comes into the host, it's coming in with a real source, real destination, and it's not double encapsulated. It's just a raw packet. Next capture point in the path is it leaving the host. So I think that's going to be here. Okay. Uh, 
Let's start with this one. Here you see that the source, excuse me, the destination address has been changed. Look at our source. 10.244.39.9. It's the exact same source. 10.244.39.9. Exact same source. This is what we were trying to reach. And before it left our host, they changed the IP address. That's the destination net. And you can see here, because where I'm capturing, what happens when a packet leaves here and it's destined for another pod? It gets double encapsulated, right? It goes to an IP and IP tunnel. Let's expose that. You see, here's our double header, like a baseball game, right? And look, scroll down. It's actually load bound, so you'll see it flip between yeah. the two. So this is the IP and IP, OK? Now let's capture it on the end, right? The destination where it received the connection, uh, the actual web on. server itself. Uh, Tony, before you move on, yeah. um, I see that the source is another 172. Is this sourcing from the service IP as well? Uh, no, no. And I, I tried to, uh, I tried to um, say that these packet captures do not match my okay. written example. Okay, in, in, in my, uh, these packet captures, the actual host IP addresses that actually connect the physical hosts is a 172 network. Oh, okay. So um, in my example, I just tried to split it up into the three common RFC 1918 spaces. Um, so for the destination, yeah, yeah, yeah. The load balancing happens on the client, not at the... No, the load balancing happens on the originating host. So the, the, yeah. yeah, I consider the client like the pod itself in this case, yeah. Yeah, well, I, you'll actually see that. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see it flipping between the IPs. Yeah, um, so this was uh, one connection. Actually, I don't know if we'll see that, Dan, because... Uh, yeah. yeah, so here's uh, the other one. So we kept doing uh, a curl request once every second. Just did a, a quick um, for loop, and it was flipping between two web servers. We had two web servers going, so it was actually going from host to host, so back and forth. Right. Nat is doing that on the source host. Right. It's doing the load balancing. Yeah. So let me let me get through this uh, this destination one. Uh, curl destination. Okay. And the point here is, uh, it's not double encapsulated anymore. You see the real source. And uh, and the destination IP address, the pod destination IP address. No longer this is the sort uh, the service IP. The service IP did not come over the tunnel. Okay. That gets natted ahead of time. All right, that was really cool to figure out because here we have these pods with this IP space that is just sort of created out of thin air, right? Um, there's no routing protocols in between any of it. So how does it actually work? It actually works because each one of those uh, IP subnets is directly connected to one another via a tunnel. So we don't need routing protocols. We just need to know what's on the other end of the tunnel. Um, and then because we're trying to hit service IPs, that actually gets changed destination that um, before it leaves the originating host um, in this case. So uh, I have a couple of other things to, uh, to bore you with. This is a dump of the IP tables chains. Okay. There's really a lot here. Okay. And this is from the lab. Yeah. How many nodes? Uh, no, no, this is just from, um, this is from the master of a cluster that's in our lab. Okay? So um, what I wanted to point out here is if I do a quick uh, control F and I try to find uh, 10, 108, 22, 238. When we created the service, the web server, and created the service, Cube proxy actually went ahead and built IP tables rules for that. If you look here, we did it in the default web service cluster IP. This is a service IP. Okay? So once your packet comes in, it evaluates a bunch of IP tables, chains. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of that. Uh, but I will say here, if it matches the destination, which is the service IP, it goes ahead and jumps it to the service. And if I find that, LHVV down here, okay? This is what's doing the load balancing. This is from the source host. 
All right, so this is mode random probability um, dot five zero 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 zero, which is fifty percent. Okay. So 50%, it's going to send you over to here, and this changes the destination NAT address. So it's going to destination NAT it once to one IP address, and the next request, it does another. And the next request, it does back to the first one, and the next request, it does to another. And that's how it does it. It does it all in IP tables. There's no load balancer container or load balancer VM or anything we're doing there. It's all done by the probability, the st st statistical probability um, as determined in IP tables. So in, in another example that Dan has, when you have, uh, in this case, it was just two web servers. So the probability is going to be 50%. It's going to hit one, then the other, one, and the other. If you have um, eight, um, it changes this probability uh, down to a smaller value. So each one gets an individual um, uh, connection. Can you weight that in IP tables? Uh, you can, and that's done here. That's done here. So it can be done evenly, mm -hmm. or it can be done... Um, unbalanced, if you wanted to. I think by default it's going to do it evenly. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's Kubernetes is eventually going to move to something called IPVS, which is supposed to be this on steroids, and you're supposed to be able to do a whole lot more with it. Um, like you can get metrics from it and all sorts of other stuff. So right now it's it's IP tables that, that's doing all the magic, but IPVS is going to be the next thing that they're going to switch to. Yeah, so um, I'll just go, uh, just, uh, I just have a couple more things to, to point out. Um, in this case, I was logged into <clears throat> the master. Uh, and again, this is just uh, straight up Linux CLI, nothing fancy there. Uh, we run the ARP command, and uh, these are normally jumbled up. I went ahead and sorted them and put some white space in between them so it could be easy to read. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to see that uh, in this case of our lab that I actually took this, these are our nodes, our hosts. These are the hardware hosts. Okay, and we reach them out of a bonded interface, a, a teamed interface. These are the pod IP addresses. And you can see they all come out of a interface that is uh, prefixed with C-A-L-I, which is the Calico prefix, or Calico prefix. Uh, this is uh, a Pixie Boot network uh, that nothing gets routed over. It was used just for standing up uh, the cluster um, and still exists. Uh, but nothing gets routed over top of it. That's sort of a uh, uh, back-end initialization. Uh, if we take a look at the routes, we could have thousands of containers and thousands of pods, and our routing table wouldn't be that big. Okay? Uh, ignoring the stuff here at the bottom, these bottom three, because they're for Pixie Boot and this in an overlay, other than that, here we have our basic routes. A basic routing table gives us a default gateway out of our directly connected host interfaces. Um, and each one of these um, is a pod that's connected to a virtual interface. You see they are slash 32s, which means they're host routes. All right, and they're directly connected to us. And the entire slash 26 is assigned to us as well. Okay? If we start looking at these routes, these subnets are all slash 26s, and they all live on the other pod, excuse me, the other hosts. Right? So there's another server where the pods all get IP space from this network. And the next host, all the pods that get deployed there all get an IP from this IP space. And how do we get there? We get to those all throughout the tunnel interface. So there's an underlay here and an overlay and no routing protocols in between. Um, Calico by default, I think by default, it's supposed to be deployed with BGP. It has BGP built into the code. We're not um, using BGP here. We're using a, a slimmed down version, which is just directly connected and static interfaces. We did not have to configure any of this IP space. We did not have to configure any of these uh, routes, tunnels, Nothing like that. And guys, that's really the beauty of all of this. Everything that I just bored you with, you will never need to know. <laughs> Calico just works. Kubernetes just works. You've heard Dan say it a bunch of times. It's just magic. It's magic because we can take a bunch of people who are familiar with Linux system administration and make them into people who um, can spread workloads over large networks without ever needing to know how the network works. As long as one physical host can talk to another physical host, that's all you need. In this case, they're all plugged into a one common switch, so they're all layer two. 
there's no networking involved. Kubernetes, or excuse me, Kubernetes doesn't do networking by default. Um, Calico as a plugin does. And it does all of this under the hood. It updates IP tables. It changes anytime you spin up new pods and new service IPs. It updates that on all the hosts. You don't actually have to do any of that. You never have to interface with IP tables. You never have to put in routes. You never have to put in tunnels. And everything can reach everything. Okay? That takes care of all of the internal cluster communication. That's pod to pod and host to host. None of what I just discussed is how we get from outside of a cluster in, right? That's another uh, technology called ingress, and, and Dan will uh, uh, spill that in just a moment. Question? I got two questions. Yeah. Um, first, uh, crap, I forgot what was going to ask. Um, now I'll just jump to the second question. So is there any um, downside to using, I guess, Calico, for example, for large-scale deployments, like large-node deployments, as far as the multiple tunnels and whatnot? Um, I, I don't know if there are any hyperscale um, issues with it. There is only one tunnel, okay? So it's a full mesh tunnel. So it's only one, every host only gets one tunnel. So wait, I thought it was, and it just knows where all the destinations are. Wait, I thought it was one tunnel per host in the network for full mesh. Uh, it's full mesh, but it's, I'm on a host right now, yeah. and it's one tunnel interface. So I don't need to maintain five tunnels to go everywhere. It's one, it's, it would be considered a multi-point interface, which means a single point on my end, multiple points on the destination side. So I only ever need to address the tunnel zero interface and nothing additional. In fact, as administrators of this network, you never even need to address that. You never even need to know what tunnel interface is it going out of. That's all orchestrated for you. That's the beauty of the orchestrated platform. Okay. Yeah. Second question. Second question. I guess, have you guys seen anywhere, I guess, just doing the research, whatnot, of any instances where Calico does fail, you need to do any troubleshooting, or is it just that good? Uh, not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> and in fact, here's, here's just so much more, you know, all this networking is completely abstracted from you. Kubernetes is an awesome orchestration platform to abstract all this networking away, so you don't need to know it. But you could just as easily rip out Calico and put in another networking plugin, and it would make no difference. It would just work under the hood. So, you know what I'm saying? So, now, the IP addresses and stuff, you know, it, it would change. But the point is, is whether I'm running Flannel or Calico or any of the other networking um, plugins that, uh, that he discussed in the slides, um, doesn't matter to the pods and shouldn't matter to you as an administrator. Um, but you should be aware of sort of how it operates to make sure it fits your business needs. So to so the pods, it doesn't matter about the plugin. So I guess where do the different um, uh, pods come to play? I guess depending on your use case and performance needs? Or so so, today, so pods are just collections of... Containers. It could be no, a single container saying, or multiple containers. I'm saying, since there are multiple CNIs, yeah. like obviously if it was just one CNI, it would be great for everything if you just have one CNI. Yeah. So um, I guess what are some of the, I guess, pros and cons of using, I guess, Calico versus like OpenB Switch? So one of the reasons we, we went with Calico is you can do firewall rules. Um, so you can actually say in the selectors thing, you can actually say this pod will only be allowed to receive traffic from pods labeled this, right? And then it will create IP tables rules. So Flannel right now doesn't do that. Um, so there are definitely benefits. The other thing that, that Calico advertises is, he said BGP, there's ways you can have multiple clusters doing BGP route sharing between each other. Um, but we don't, we don't have that, we don't have really multiple clusters. Um, the, Reason to use Flannel, Flannel is supposed to perform slightly better um, because it's, it, it, well, for one, it doesn't do IP tables and a bunch of other stuff. So there are legit reasons why you pick one over the other. Um, you just kind of have to start digging in to, to do that. <coughs> but it shouldn't change the applications. That's kind of the point. Yeah, sure. And just as a sidebar, do you know Calico supports, um, I guess, service much in Jenny? No, not that I know. Not, not from my, my understanding. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, so, so as far as I can tell, Calico has, uh, runs a couple of internal uh, containers uh, which just sort of orchestrate and hit the APIs for QProxy which drive the IP tables. That, that's it. And that's all away from you. You never see it. Um, it does it all. Anytime you spin up a new pod with a new IP address, um, that's done throughout the cluster for you. Um, uh, so it's pretty cool. Okay. mentioned that you can't talk 
from outside. So you as a user, um, this is you, and you're trying to connect to some Kubernetes cluster, right? And that has physical nodes. So these will be the nodes. Um, we'll have three nodes in this case. And uh, <clears throat> you'll have pods inside, all load balanced. Um, there's a couple of ways you can you can actually externally interface with them. There's one way that you probably shouldn't do, um, which is host network is true, and that basically exposes all your physical interfaces, all your physical infrastructure to the pods. Um, there's a handful of things, reasons why you might want to do that, like uh, some of the, uh, the uh, if you think of like Kubernetes, like the Kube proxy and stuff, they might need to see everything about what's going on and so forth. Um, but generally, if, if you do host network is true, your, all your container is now going to have all the physical interfaces of whatever node it's running on. So that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Um, but that would work if you wanted to do that. The next option would be node port. So um, we mentioned that Kube proxy, um, Kube proxy lives on every single box. And you can actually say, I want a node port. And, if you just say, I want a node port, it's going to randomly give you a port. Now, there's some limitations to this. It ends up being like 30,000, I don't know the exact numbers, to like 32,000 something. So you're limited to ports in that range. Also, if you think of users, users don't usually go to google.com port 32,000. So that's a pretty large limitation there too. Um, but what that will do is when you say specify a node port, it will sign you a, an available port that's available throughout the cluster. And now every single queue proxy is actually does this. Queue proxy will now listen on every single box on your entire cluster to that port. So if you connect to it, you'll go down the queue pro proxy, which is listening on that port, and then it will forward it to the correct service, however that's set up. So you would say node port forward to this service IP address and QProxy will take it, shoot it out to the service IP and get it out to the right pod. So that means every single box you hit is going to give you the same results, if that makes sense, throughout your cluster. Um, biggest limitations, the port numbers, you, you're also limited to however many ports. So we, we did, um, the way traffic is working is it's kind of taking this concept and it's listening. So it's another container that's listening on ADN443 with the, the host networking on every single box. Um, the benefit to doing, doing this is uh, because it's a reverse proxy, you can, you can sort based on some extra th criteria. So if it's an HTTP request, an HTTP request says this is for the host uh, student1.kubernetes.lab, that was why our DNS record was actually important because what's happening is um, you could host multiple websites on your, on your thing because when you make an HTTP request, you can now host multiple sites on one IP and what will happen is it will look at the host Traffic will process that, and then you'll, you're saying, if you, if you notice, I made you change that host name in the, uh, the traffic conf, and then it will hope forward it down to the correct, um, the, correct, uh, the correct service, and then it goes to the correct pods. You can also do paths, so like if you wanted to, you could have multiple website pods, and based on the URI, the, the path that they put in, it will actually go to different services as well. With HTTPS, it uses something called SNI. Um, HTTPS, when, when you make a request, it says, this I want whatever the, the site is, and based on that, it will, it will sort it out. And the benefit here is now, on, if, if I hit 80 or 443 on any box, it works. So, of course, now the problem is, what, what do I point my DNS record at? Um, if I had multiple of these clusters, for that, you would generally have a a traditional load balancer and so you would say if 80 comes in you're going to load balance between all of the traffic instances and so now you're loading load balancing across traffic um, there's other ingresses that are a little bit more advanced than that so um, f5 a10 or the, the 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 cloud providers 
what they're doing is they're actually joining the load balancer in with the network and you basically cut out the middleman. So um, I mentioned that there's an ingress, ingress controller. The ingress controller is basically updating with locations of pods and, and all of that. And when, when traffic comes in, um, it will then automatically go. You, you sort of cut out the middleman there and that, that's better, but then of course you need a, a traditional load balancer or something along those lines. So um, there's lots of different ingress options. So these aren't the only options, but that's kind of at a high level what each of them are doing. So questions, comments? So is there any way native within um, Kubernetes to do, I guess, native HA, or would you have to have some kind of application load balancer in front of it? Yeah, you have to have some sort of, cause like, so you can do HA in this configuration with Trefi mm -hmm. based on this. Right. Um, it, it just depends. I mean, that would be the HA part, cause if you lose this node, then this should sense it and then just start sending it down. Um, all the pods that then are on that node, instead of like vMotion or whatever, it would just say, oh, I lost all these pods and start bringing them up on other, other nodes throughout the cluster. Okay. And I guess one other question. Um, so I guess all this makes sense, like the whole deep dive into Kubernetes and the Kubernetes networking. Now, to make this talk out to the traditional network, because obviously you can't just can make this talk to your internet at large. So yep. I guess what routes would actually get advertised to, I guess, your edge and how would that traffic look like? If you're your organization like I don't know, Google and you have this massive Kubernetes cluster and you as a user wants to talk in, um, I guess, yeah, I guess what would the routing look like as far as what routes from, I guess, between the host, service IP, pod IP, so, so to the edge and yeah. external pod to out is just that. Yeah. So you would see your, your traffic coming from the individual nodes. So, so I guess in the case of, I guess say just some website like Google, so you Go to Google, resolve your DNS to wherever the IP is, mm -hmm. hit their edge. Yep. And then. So, like Google you. specifically, when, when you do this, um, like these load balancers can also have multiple IP addresses. And the ingress controller will actually auto assign. Somebody mentioned when he did a kubectl get ingress, he noticed the address was missing. Because that's not, we were doing it the other way. but. Um, when we were using the Google load balancer, we would say create an ingress. What would happen is it would run out to Google's load balancer and they would from some pool assign us an IP and then that, that IP would show up and then you could hit that directly. Um, but all the traffic from the outside gets terminated here. And you can actually do like, um, one of the things that was pretty slick is we actually had it doing um, HTTPS. So, we were breaking TLS connections at the load balancer and sending it HTTP down to our, our things. You could, we could have done HTTPS, break it here and done HTTPS again. But we actually were then also, um, we were doing dynamic assigning of, uh, of certificates from Let's Encrypt. So when I would go and say, create me an ingress, um, there's a container that communicates with Let's Encrypt it goes out, so if anyone's ever gotten a, a Let's Encrypt, they basically, uh, to make sure you own the domain, what you do is you, you we would ask for an IP, and uh, this would all kind of happen magically. So we'd say, create me an ingress, it would grab the IP, Let's Encrypt would say, here's a challenge, I want you to put this on your website. They give you some like weird URI path and some weird thing, and then once it's done, they hit it, make sure that it, it was what they said, and then that's how they give it to you. So it orchestrated this whole, that whole process. So we would say, give me an ingress. It would wait till an IP was done. It would stand up a pod with the challenge that Let's Encrypt wanted. And then Let's Encrypt would come down, hit it, make sure it was right. They would then give us our, 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 our they would sign our private key that we created and then send this up to the load balancer, and then that would then terminate the SSL. So it was like, you didn't have to even do the PKI portion of it. So, um, so the outside world would see your load balancer, generally, is how, how you'd want to do it. Okay. The outside would see your load balancer. Will your IGPs, will your interior still see all those various uh, RFC addresses you had in your example? Or? The interior, um, 
So each host, each host only knows about it only knows how to route the IP space that has been assigned to the pods mm -hmm. throughout your cluster. Okay. Um, uh, and for for traffic to come in, it needs to be from the outside in. It needs to use ingress. Mm -hmm. uh, but from going out, it's just going to be NAT. It's going to follow the default gateway and use NAT. Okay. You know, for example, um, you guys all reached out to GitHub, mm -hmm. right? Same architecture. It's just when it reaches the final gateway. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's uh, our firewall at the uh, at the office. This it's is just NAT. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. We make good time. We're about 30 minutes ahead.